Hey there, and welcome to the Dynamics Hot Dish Podcast, serving up stories and knowledge on Dynamics 365 and the Power Platform. This is what's hot in Dynamics. You're now joining Merlin Schweiger, Liz McGlennon, and Ashley Steiner. Well, welcome to the podcast, AJ. Today we have a guest speaker on to talk about imposter syndrome. Um, AJ, do you want to share a little bit about yourself? So I was a consultant for eight years in the dynamics community. I moved into working for an organization and then finally I've gone uh, independent. And so I've been independent now for it be a year next week. Awesome. We worked together at a previous employer a few years back. I remember, AJ, you were in my, um, my first boot camp I ever did at that partner and you were learning CRM 2011 in that mm-hmm. class. And We've been on a few projects together and had a few good times in Milwaukee. <laughs> so AJ, um, why, why do you specialize in talking about imposter syndrome? Mostly because I felt it my entire life. In this case, I think it's um, very poignant for consulting and just in general and pervasive in consulting is, is what I was trying to get at. So it's one of those things that I think everybody feels but no one really talks about, no one really shares. And, you know, I think in consulting, you end up being um, put on a pedestal almost. You know all of the answers to everything because we're paying you to know the answers to everything. And I feel like it's been, a, for me, it's been a journey and it's something that I find the more that I talk about, the better that I feel personally. And also the fact that, you know, everybody else tends to share the same thing. So they say, you know what? Oh man, I'm so glad you said something. I feel the same way. So it's something that I've um, talked about on not only this show, but on a couple other shows as well. And uh, I just feel passionate about getting that conversation started and saying, well, how do we get past this? How do we move forward? And then encouraging other people to challenge themselves and to you know say, yeah, hey, you're probably, you're probably fine. So I wonder if for the people listening, should we define what imposter syndrome is? I don't know if everyone even knows you know, what, how it's defined and sure. when it comes out. Yes. It was defined as imposter phenomenon, since it's not really an illness or a sickness, but it was imposter phenomenon by uh, two psychologists in the seventies. It's Pauline Rose Clance and Suzanne Imes. And so they noticed that women that were high achieving women were constantly coming to them and saying, you know, I just don't feel like I should have the job that I have, or I should have the title that I have, or I should have the salary that I have. And it's just a lot of feelings of self-doubt and guilt. And then just constantly feeling that you are going, going to be exposed as a fraud at any point in time. So I know you kind of singled out women in that, which is fine, right? I think that that's common that women, but you said you feel it and you felt it a lot as a consultant. So obviously it does cross, I'm guessing genders and race and all of that, right? Yeah. So uh, it was started out like, so it was women that were coming to these two psychologists, but yes, it, it is anyone have it. Uh, they say that 70% of people across their career will eventually feel it. So I'm actually surprised that number is not higher. <laughs> I'm surprised it's that high. Really? I think. Yeah. Why is that? I, I don't know. I guess I just thought that there were more like, I know a lot of people are very confident and maybe they feel it and they're just exuding confidence and so that's and I don't know I guess I just it's it's just higher than I thought it would be I think a lot of people pretend to be confident but like they just don't surface those internal like self-doubt thoughts externally like fake it till you make it exactly yeah I was gonna say I feel like that's part of the problem with imposter phenomenon is that if you're feeling that you have this perception that everyone else knows what they're doing right and you, you don't realize that everybody's pretending, like everybody's playing at this. Everybody thinks that they know what they're doing, but they don't actually. So I guess I don't, knowing that 70% of the people out there like feel it at some point ought to in some way alleviate that feeling for anybody who's like, well, everybody else knows what they're doing and I'm the only idiot on this call. Like, no, no, everybody else is just as clueless as you are. Well, 70% are admitting to feeling it too. And that's why I feel like the number would be actually higher. I bet there's another percentage of people out there that do feel it, but maybe wouldn't answer honestly to the poll or however they collected that data, you know. And it's nuanced a little bit as well. So it's maybe not 
I completely feel like a fraud, but you can have characteristics of that. So um, not taking credit for your own work or passing the buck off or feeling like you, you don't deserve the role that you have, the salary that you have, or maybe that you just happen to be somewhere because of luck or your network or you know whatever it is. So just not owning the achievements that you've personally made in your education, your experience, and combining that together into those, you know what, maybe I do know what, I, what I'm doing and where I'm at. And I, I have owned this. I do own that. Sure. So AJ, why does it affect us? Like, why do people experience this? So you, you've both been, I think everyone here has been a consultant at some point, right? Yeah. And so I think it's one of those things that externally you are put into positions of growth. And so when you're in that, so it's like, well, maybe you don't know the next thing about field service. And that's something that is out there, but you're thrown on a field service project. And now what happens? Well, you are in that, I don't really know field service, but now you're the expert in that because you're hired to be, right? And it's not that you can't acquire that knowledge and you can't get it. And you're probably more apt to figure it out quickly than somebody that was you know, pulled off the street to do it, right? But at the same time, it's, you are seen as the expert in that. So the expectation is here, but the experience is not necessarily where it needs to be. And it's not, it's not again that you can't find it either, but it's just that at that moment, when you are, all of the spotlights are on you, then what happens? You have to come up with an answer. And you panic. <laughs> you, <laughs> and you can't always say, you know what? That's a good question. Let me get back to you. It's like, you said that for every question. So either these are all amazing questions or you don't know what you're doing. I feel so targeted by that. Cause I feel like that's why I got out of consulting and why I decided it wasn't for me. Cause I got thrown on like a power BI project. I, I didn't know anything about power BI and I was the one building it. Right. Or right. like they did want to throw me on a field service um, project. That's a great example. And I've always kind of specialized in sales, know a little bit about customer service marketing and I was like, yeah, I just, I can't keep doing this to myself. Like, I don't know anything. I didn't feel like the smartest person walking into the room. And I, yeah. but I mean, it does, it's not about being the smartest person. It's just about knowing enough to like get through it. And that's one of the reasons I got out of consulting because I didn't know everything and that's uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's one of the most stressful parts about being a consultant in our industry um, because you can't know everything anymore about the platform. I think it's changed too in the last several years with just how much Microsoft has pushed into the products. Uh, mm -hmm. So now it's not just I'm a Dynamics CRM consultant. It's you are a power platform consultant. You have to know how to build Canvas apps, model-driven apps, Power Automate, Power Virtual Agent, uh, Power BI. And then on top of that, someone says portals and you kind of go, oh, okay. You know? <laughs> uh, but, you know, it's just- Please don't say so portals. <laughs> it's so it's so expansive and I was looking at um, gigs recently and people have posted well here's what we're expecting for a consultant and as I was like, looking at the role itself it had you have to be a PM a BA and a developer and a consultant all in one so they didn't say that specifically but you have to have you have to know how to manage all of their requirements and elicit requirements. You also have to know how to manage the timeline, the budget and the scope. And like, so they're listing those out as requirements. And it's like, you have six jobs rolled into one role. There's no way that one person can be this unicorn that's gonna come in and say, I can do everything. Sure, you know, we're not all wizards, right? It's impossible. <laughs> not even wizards can do all of those things at once. Yeah. <laughs> Well, and they can take completely different skill sets, right? Like somebody who's a good yeah. VA is not always going to be a good PM. Yeah, right. And how many? To, sorry, I was going to say, how many developers do you know that are good PMs and VAs? Zero. Oh, VAs is a little different, but PMs zero. I know no developers who can PM personally. I was talking to uh, a guy that he speaks at a BA and a PM conference about this topic, and so he said that he would switch hats, right? So he would have like literal hats and he would switch. And then it was almost like a um, multi-personality 
conversation where he would talk as one personality to the other because they are often conflicting roles or it's a it's a kind of a dance right and in that specific case where you know the pm's trying to control the the budget the time and the scope and then the ba is trying to make sure that the customer is getting exactly what they want yeah i i feel like especially those two roles are conflicting i don't know i went through Microsoft sure step training like a decade ago. And the guy who was teaching the class was like, you cannot PM and BA and be successful at both. You just can't do it. Well, I was just going to ask. So like, what are things that you can do? And that might be moving us too far ahead. But yeah. Like, can we start with like, how do we, have we talked about like enough about how to identify it? Like when it's happening either to you or to other people that you're working with? Well, so I've come up with my own, let's say measurements of success to figure out what your, like what the skill set is for asking yourself, am I in this position in the right way? And so there's three questions that I'll ask myself. And, and the first one is, am I set up for success? So as we just talked about in that, that one role, if you are all of those things, well, you're a single point of failure for literally all of those things, right? So you wouldn't be set up for success in that position. And so then, you know, it's more of like a flow chart where, so now you ask yourself, well, can I change those expectations? Can I say, you know, I'm really, you need somebody else that's going to PM this because I can't PM this as I'm writing literal scripts or developing a Canvas app or something like that, right? If the answer is no to that, then generally it's, well, I don't really, you don't have anything. You can't change your expectations. You just have to grit it and, and bear it a little bit, right? So that's one of those things where burnout happens very quickly. So if you're in that role and you're not going to be successful, then you tend to get burned out. And now you're going back to everybody else going, man, this is just I'm pulling from everything that I have. I'm not getting filled back up. So I need something else that's going to help me in my career. Right. So I think that's the first thing is just asking if you're set up for success and can you have those conversations to change those expectations? It's okay to specialize too. Like, I don't think you have to, do work or take a project I mean you can say no like you can say like this thing whatever it is or if they're trying to pull you in too many directions like this is not my specialty like this is not my forte this is not what I am experienced with or like the path I want to go down and that's I think perfectly acceptable and if you stick with your specialty like you will find other work especially in our industry that is in that area so like no, I just don't think you should try to do it all yeah I would also say at least in my experience, I feel like customers, and this could be whether you're like a consultant and a partner or even like internal customers, customers are generally pretty understanding about that. Like as long as you're oh, essentially open and honest, you're like, okay, I, I know a lot about these things that are part of your project. And so like, I feel very comfortable with these things. Like I can help you with these things. This part over here, like, I'll, I'll pick on the portal. The portal part, like, yeah, I know a little bit about the portal, but I'm no expert in the portal. I got somebody else I can call if I've got portal questions, but like, this is not my area of expertise. And so as long, I feel like as long as you set that expectation, most people on the receiving end of that, except for maybe very demanding customers like Ashley, but my, I feel like most people are gonna say, yeah, I understand it's cool as long as you can find the answer for me, as long as you can solve the problem for me, whether it's you or somebody else that you know, I'm okay with that. I think I've seen people get into trouble where they start talking like they know what they're talking about when they don't know what they're talking about. And I feel like after you sort of set that expectation, you get a little bit too far down that path. Now you've set the expectation of, yeah, I know what I'm talking about. And you have zero clue. Like then you're just, you're, you're running yourself into a corner and eventually you're going to get caught and it's going to be very awkward. So, but how, if you're feeling that way, sorry, actually, let me go next. Like, how do you differentiate? Like, are you feeling that way just because it's imposter syndrome and you, you really do know what you're talking about versus like you should, you know what I mean? Like, how do you know if it's legitimate or not? Yeah. I think the first thing that you would have to do is ask yourself, are you in that spot? Can you, do you really have that assessed your own skill set, et cetera, but then look at peers. So look at your community, your friends, your uh, other people that are in the same role, a mentor, if you have one, 
and ask them, hey, you know, so I feel like this in this role. Am I crazy or is this something that I really should feel or I should brush up on? And that's really the second question that, that I'll ask myself is, do I have the knowledge and skill set to be in this position that I'm in, right? Can I do this successfully? If not, you know, can I get the knowledge to do that quickly? So we were talking about field service earlier. And then can I brush up on that so I can learn that enough to do a successful implementation? Or like Merlin said, do I need to call somebody and say, hey, I met this person and she does an amazing job at field service. Let's grab her and bring her into this because she is a rock star here. Ashley, what were you going to ask? I was actually going to ask a very similar question. I mean, and I think that it answered what I was going to ask because I was going to say, well, what if you don't know? I mean, clearly that's not imposter syndrome then, right? It's if, if you're in the situation and you do have the answers, but you don't feel comfortable giving them or showing, highlighting that you do. So there's a slight difference there. I also feel that really just goes back to the first question is, are you really set up for success? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was also going to say, you you also need to learn the the consultant trick of how you answer a question is never in the definitive. Like, I'm pretty sure it works that way. Like I do this all the time. Mm -hmm. I feel pretty confident that it works like that. That means I, I feel like I've seen it work like that. I'm pretty sure it works like that. But there's always that chance that like, well, I haven't done it in six months. Maybe it's changed or maybe it doesn't actually work the way that I thought that it did. So I give myself that little bit of an out. It's, uh, it's the, the consulting trick. I feel like we had a conversation like that recently. It was, yeah, it was closing out like opportunities, I think. And I said, uh, we can do this. And you said, no, it doesn't work like that. And uh, we went back and forth a little bit. And then, and I think we were both right. Mm-hmm. So it didn't work like that before the new release, I think had, had changed it. And so now we went back through and it was it's like, well, yeah. She's like, okay, now I see how this is. There was a, a, a flag that you had to check. There was a so new setting that, yeah. Yep. And, and I, so it was now, new. So like, I don't know about yeah. it. <laughs> Things so changed we all right. the time. Like, yeah. <laughs> she was testing it in hers. I was testing it in my environment. And then it just doesn't work. Why not? And it's just, well, it here's what still you have to do. didn't do what the client wanted it to do though. Like the setting was no. not configurable. So it was just like an honor and off thing. So it still didn't yeah. solve the problem, unfortunately. I think, so you guys touch on a good topic there, right? That there's, it changes so quickly that, I, I mean, how could anyone ever know any, like everything about right. dynamics of our platform? There's just no way. So I, there are probably a lot of more people that feel this imposter syndrome or phenomenon, as you called it earlier, because how do you, how do you really know, unfortunately, when you do, yeah. but you're just like, and, oh, has it been upgraded since then? See, and I feel like that's like, if you're feeling, if you're feeling that way, like, I don't know if I know this, like that should come to some comfort because it's, it is always changing. It may have changed since the last time. And it is literally impossible for there to be any human on this earth that knows every single thing that there is about today in any power platform environment. Like you just, you can't, you can't have all the answers. Nobody has all the answers anywhere. And so the fact that you don't have all of the answers is not your failing. It's simply just a statement of fact. As we are talking, we are becoming more obsolete in this conversation (laughs) right now. True. I feel like we do that a lot, or maybe we should do it more. I think we started doing it and then we kind of faded like, okay, if you were listening to this past this date, it could be different in the system because you just never know what Microsoft's going to change. I just want to throw out there too, that this is not something that just affects consultants or our industry. Like this is something that every human experiences, no matter what job I don't even and I don't even think it has to be work related like I think you could experience like on a personal level too or in other aspects of your life so if you're listening to this and you're not in the Microsoft Biz app space like it's still absolutely relevant or if you're not a consultant and you're on an internal team like it's still relevant too well my first thought always goes to your guys's favorite subject here is like sports right so I think of think of all those you know teens that are playing you know high school sports and they have this imposter syndrome of knowing things or being able, do they have the ability to do something? And that's probably where a lot of it starts, which is unfortunate. You know, that's, that's funny that you mentioned sports. It's one of those things that, so as a guy 
other guys will walk up to you the first time that you're meeting somebody and they'll ask like, oh, so where are you from? And then once you say where you're from, they're like, oh, so uh, did you see what happened? Like insert sports reference there. And then my immediate go-to is I, I used to not do this, but now I do just because I don't have to fake it. But before it was, oh yeah, no, I missed that game. I, I didn't catch that one. And, and then they would talk about it, whatever. Now I'm just like, I don't watch sports. And then they go, like not even, and then insert, and like football? You don't even watch football? No sports. And it's like, wow, really? And then it's like, yeah. It's like, what? so so really nothing. <laughs> it's just like, can't get past that one step. <laughs> and, but I also found Good that it, it's you, also though. changed. <laughs> I mean, I, I just don't, well, I don't necessarily care about it, but at the same time, it's also representing myself in a, in a false narrative that, I don't care and I don't want to talk about it. I'd rather talk about literally anything else and you know what you do and why you do what you do and what you're passionate about, whatever. But um, that to me, it changes the way that people immediately then respond to you. So Merlin, if you said, you know, I don't watch sports at all and you go, great. So what do you do? What are your hobbies? You know, now we have to have a different conversation. Let's and talk about gaming. <laughs> When I feel like I, I have ask. a complete opposite problem, AJ, where, you know, people don't expect, I mean, it's just opposite, right? Of the genders yeah. where I, I know everything probably about every professional in college, you know, I would say major sport right now, what's going on. And that's, people wouldn't expect that. Yeah. And so when it comes to like building trivia teams, you would be my first go-to person to add to the sports and Merlin would be the one for like, I don't know, pop culture maybe, or uh gaming gaming yeah gaming maybe okay nerd nerd culture yeah thank you yeah perfect where would liz fit in yeah uh, I'm like what's my trivia game? specialty we keeping this professional or <laughs> <laughs> now wow. i really want to know the answer <laughs> Ooh, well uh <laughs> that's awesome um What's the next question on the agenda? Just moving right along. <laughs> yeah, so I think the third thing is, um, there's a question that you have to ask yourself. So you, you've got the, am I set up for success? And then you have, do I have the knowledge and skills? And then the other one is, this is kind of when you hit that top echelon, it's have I petered out, right? So if you're not familiar with the, the Peter principle, you know, people tend to rise to their own level of incompetence is, is basically how that works. Uh, I think you've also seen this as like the golden handcuff scenario where you're in this amazing position. You don't really want to rock the boat because, you know, you're not performing a whole lot, but you're getting paid a whole lot to, to not perform that. Do you rock the boat? And I think the, the question there is, am I challenged it is really what you have to ask yourself. Am I being challenged, you know, mentally, am I, am I the go-to person for any one thing or have I kind of exceeded where my role is and I'm not really growing at all? So maybe I should push for a different role, a different position, a different industry, you know, whatever to kind of go back to that growth. It's another cause of burnout, I think too, is like, oh, I'm stagnating, but at the same time, I'm really comfortable stagnating. And what do you, what do, you do with that? At a certain point, the boredom sets in mm -hmm. and you're like, well, now I'm bored. Yeah. Oh, so I guess I was just gonna ask like, if, if I'm feeling like I'm an imposter in some given situation, I can kind of go through the flow chart. Is there anything that I can do if I just don't feel confident, but need to? Like, I, I guess in my experience, and I say this mostly in talking with other people who have been in a situation where they're like, I don't know if I can do this. And I'm like the cheerleader on the side being like, no, you can definitely do this, but I'm not sure like, what does that person need to feel that confidence to realize like, I've got this, I can do this, I belong here, any thoughts? I think it's really going back to asking people that are of, you. so I would ask you Merlin, hey, uh, here's how I feel about my technical skills in dynamics at this moment, right? So I, I know you, I respect your assessment and you know, same thing with, with you, Liz. Actually, we just met today, so uh, I'll, I'll come back to you. But, in like a year that that works yeah yeah we'll come back cool but i think going into 
that conversation saying, Hey, here's where I, here's what I'm feeling. Can you validate this? Is this something that is just in my head and I need to move past that? Or is this something that you can accurately assess? And, and I know Merlin that, you know, you have, it's no holds barred. It's just, I, you don't care about hurting my feelings. It's just, here's verbatim. I'm going to have extreme candor to exactly who you are. And, and I'm fine with that. You know, um, Marilyn doesn't care about um, hurting anyone's feelings, by the way. Not at all. It's nope. just. <laughs> you should meet his brother, Andrew. It's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I think AJ joined the family, guys. Yeah. <laughs> well, well played. Well played. To be honest, I, I think that's it. You know, talking to mentors, talking to other people that are uh, there that can accurately assess it. And, you know, having those frank conversations is the, the biggest thing. Uh, I think being open and, and transparent on that is another one too. So I think often the first person that we lie to most frequently is ourselves. And then just being able to assess, all right, is this really the truth? Am I really feeling this? Um, do I really have these skills, et cetera? That's good advice. So, you probably do, by the way, listener. You probably do have those skills. Believe in yourself. I've, yeah. I've met several CRM admins that I was like, you should not be here. You should be consulting or owning your own practice or doing something completely different so so many people i've met i'm just like wow that's that person is phenomenal and you could have this bright future in something completely different yeah that's a tough thing to overcome like and you can talk to your mentors your friends your peers and get feedback and it could all be positive but i feel like someone could still be lacking confidence even after confirming that they they should be confident in that area so that's not something easy to deal with well and one of as one of those admins used to be one of those admins that people would say oh you could do this or this or move into management or become more broad and don't just focus on what I'll say like what I I really struggled with is I always knew somebody who knew more than me and so it was hard for me to be like well but look at that person because like I'm not them I'm not there so I can't move to the next level um, even though there were people totally supportive and encouraging and saying, push yourself or things like that. So I, I think that one of the points is also to not look outwardly, but look inwardly at yourself. Cause I was always looking at other people saying, well, I'm not them, so I can't do it. That's a good point. So Ashley, there's a lot of people that I think feel that same thing where they look at, I'm not, I'm not Ashley. I, I don't have all of this amazing knowledge in CRM, so I can't do whatever it is I'm trying to do. What would you, what would you say to that person? And then to encourage them to move into that, you know, is it, is there something that you do that said, well, here's my first step forward into being awesome and owning my own podcast and doing that. I don't, I co-own it. We should say that well. Um, Still. <laughs> yeah. So, so I guess the, that's imposter syndrome probably right there is like lowering myself by saying co-own instead of just owning it. Um, yeah. So I think the first Thing is finding someone who's willing to take a chance and risk on you in a safe environment. I had, you know, a, a manager previously who would say those things like you could do so much more and then created this environment where like, if I failed, it was a safe environment to be like, okay, cool. Here's how you failed, why you failed. And then let's try it again. And so I know that that's not like the easiest way, but that's what I, I did. Right. Is I found somebody who truly believed that I could do more than just being a CRM admin and said, cool, let's do whatever we ha- can to make it successful. So that's, I mean, that's how it worked out for me. I, I don't know if everyone else is that lucky to be in that kind of position. Or I guess if you are that manager listening, it's okay if you're, if people fail, like failure is not r- bad or wrong, it, but creating that space where you can learn from that failure um, and that your failure doesn't then feed the imposter syndrome. Because I've failed, I've failed so much over the last year. If you're not, not been just yeah. a Sierra Madman. If you're not failing, you're not pushing yourself out of your comfort zone. And like, yeah, yeah actually to your point, like failures are not bad things. They're just learning moments. You just learn from them and move on. It's the fastest way to learn. Mm-hmm. So think about all the times that you failed and you go, wow, I'm not making that mistake again. I'm not going to import that or publish all customizations to the base solution. And that's how you get a lessons learned episode. <laughs> right. Or run a bulk delete job that literally deletes everything. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, you'll only do that once. Only once. Well, everything's gone. You can't do it again. <laughs> <laughs> Please tell me that right, wasn't in production. <laughs> no, it was a sandbox environment. Thank God. Okay. No problems. <laughs> but still, uh, any, I mean, any any last thoughts here? We're uh, kind of coming up on our time limit. If I had to give any advice at all, I'd say you know just trust yourself. You've earned the position that you're in. You've gotten here through your own unique perspective, your own unique education and experience, and proceed as if success was inevitable, that you are just going to succeed in whatever it is that you're doing. I like it. Merlin, do you want to ask our closing guest? Oh, uh, yes. The, the most important question for every guest. What is your favorite hot dish? And do you know what a hot dish is? I do know what a hot dish is. I've never had it. Like any kind of casserole hot dish. Wow. Anything that's like baked in the oven? (laughs) I mean, (laughs) yes, casseroles in general, but like not an actual hot dish. So a casserole is a hot dish. Yeah. You can you can flex the category a little bit there. Yeah. Okay, so like we're not talking about say macaroni and cheese, right? Because yeah. you prep it and then you put it in the oven. So yeah, it doesn't, have have, mm-hmm. doesn't have to have tater tots in it. Okay, so if that's the criteria, then my wife makes an amazing baked like buffalo mac and cheese with chicken in it that is phenomenal. So I would say that dish. I think we might need the recipe to give out to people. That might be a popular <laughs> one. Yeah, that's... It's phenomenal. And I only get this stuff when you know, we have company over. So I try to have people over as often as possible because she's like, oh yeah, I'm gonna make this and this and this. Yes, yes, cool. This is great. It's a treat. That's so awesome. It's phenomenal. I know. Well, AJ, thank you very much for joining us and sharing your perspectives. Thanks for having me. And uh, I think we'll wrap it there for today. Thanks everyone who's listening. Thank you for listening to the Dynamics Hot Dish Podcast. For additional content and previous episodes, check out our website at dynamicshotdish.com, follow us on Twitter at Dynamics Hot Dish, and subscribe to our podcast for notifications. Thanks. See you next time.